You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we've got working engines in Fab Facts. A genocidal tyrant has been poisoned in the randomizer. Attention! It's Dr. Peter Caddick Adams. Oh, sir, yes, sir. Uh, that's all coming up in pod 235, sir. You lovely boy. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. This is Christmas Control. Stand by. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. I just thought I'd sneak in a bit of Windsor Davis. Wow. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I don't you know, know what to say to that. Whenever I can, I do. Yeah, no, it's beautifully done. And obviously Thanks. that's very um, Anderson-themed because of Terrell. Absolutely Terrell, right. For those who don't know, because Windsor Davis played Sergeant Major Zero that's in the 1983 it. Jerry Anderson series Terror Hawks. Yeah. And it's those sort of little facts that people come uh, back for again and again to this well, the Jerry Anderson podcast. Is it, though? I suppose so. Well, be a I don't fact know what else. later. Yeah, they do keep coming back, so something must be doing it. Absolutely. Uh, if you'd like to let us know why you keep coming back, Podstron, <laughs> email us podcast at jerryanderson.com uh, and we shall read it out and be flabbergasted uh, next time. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Like, uh, now, I'm Jamie yeah. Anderson. Oh, yes, and I'm Richard James. Uh, and who's that bloke over there? Well, that must be Chris Dale. Brilliant. Oh, he's here because he does the randomizer. He does the, the randomizer. End, where he does a random Jerry random. Anderson show and he watches it random. and he says things about uh, random. it randomly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, That's it. Richard, uh, mm. for those ones who are not familiar with this opening segment, uh, we basically say the same thing every week. So how, recently, how, yeah. I've been trying to shake it up a little bit, haven't I? You uh, with have. varying degrees of success, where uh, very much in the spirit of Chris Dale's <laughs> randomizer, I have uh, a die. That's when you say degrees of success, of you mean last week was a shambles. Last week was a total shambles. Yeah, so yeah. let's hope that one of okay. our couple of remaining options oh. uh, works for you. So, so we've just got two left. We've been doing it four weeks, have we? And that's a, it. A, a yeah. die so has six sides. So, we've got okay. two more. I could have had a 20-sided die, but oh. no, it's a six-sided. So here we go. Go on. Oh. Ah. Oh. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Let's hope this is more up your strata than uh, okay. last week's was. Yes. This week's introduction is to be performed in the style... Of Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Enterprise. Oh! <laughs> uh, briefing, briefing the crew of the Enterprise uh, for an upcoming away mission. So, All right. uh, I hope you can manage this. Uh, yes. Good luck with your Patrick Stewart impression. <clears throat> Over to you, Richard James. Mr. Data, we've received information about the Jerry Anderson podcast. Uh, I would like you, uh, number one, to take control of Fab Facts, which will be coming up very shortly. Beverly. Uh, if you could please uh, take control of uh, the Jerry Anderson newsy news news news, and uh, Commander, well, Commander Dale uh, will be helming the randomizer a little later on. Uh, also, uh, Wesley Crusher, if you could please make sure that the Podstrons have their lovely messages read out in between, and that we'll hear the second part of the interview with Dr. Peter Caddick Adams. Make it so. Engage. How was that? Uh, it came and went, didn't it? I, I mean, there are Osrons across the planet applauding <laughs> that gallant effort. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's call it that, shall we? <laughs> let's call it that. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, you, there were you, moments. You it had its moments. Got some of that. I got the spirit of the man, yeah, didn't I? Yeah, you really did. Yes. You see. Goodness me. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we can't top that. So, should we just wrap oh, up quick. this episode? Oh, oh, I thought you were going to wrap up the whole dice introduction thing. No, no because we've got one more, no. and I'm sure right. that next week's will uh, <laughs> take you by surprise, shall we say. <sighs> oh, right, okay. Cool. Forward to it. Well, I mean, there's nothing more I can say, really. So oh, good. Should... I've done it. i shut him up. <laughs> shall we move That's on? That's what it took. To the first section of this. <laughs> uh, 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 it's Fab Facts, isn't it? Make it so. <laughs> now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Well, I think every segment now, including Fab Facts, is going to feel rather weak and nothing well, after your so. Patrick Stewart impression. Absolutely. Nothing's going to top that. But uh, let's hope that the randomness of Fab Facts will help with that. So I've got a book of Fab Facts. I'm going to flick mm. through it. Richard will shout Fab, yep. possibly in the voice of Patrick Stewart. You never know. Mm. And uh, then I'll read a Fab Fact from that page. Are you ready? Born ready. Okay, here we go. 
Fab! <laughs> it was a little bit, wasn't it? It was, it was. Difficult I mean, to shout like Patrick Stewart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree, I agree. Uh, well, uh, go on. It's interesting that it's fab, because this yes. is kind of fab. So, is it? Uh, now, all of you Podstrons, I'm sure, and especially you, Richard James, will appreciate and know that the model makers on Thunderbirds were absolute geniuses at building miniature aeroplanes. Oh, yeah. Miniature craft of all sorts. But yep. did you know that they made some planes that could actually fly? Well, unlike Thunderbird 2. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm, uh, now, yeah. In Thunderbird 6, the yeah. Thunderbirds movie from 1968, in addition to the life-sized Tiger Moth aircraft, sorry if that is a spoiler for those who haven't seen Thunderbird 6, there were several radio-controlled models that were employed to get additional angles of the incredible aerial stunts from that film. Mm -hmm. This became essential after filming of the life-size plane became impossible due to legal complications. You can right. see a previous fab fact for details yes. there. Yes, But normal run-of-the-mill radio-controlled aircraft were not enough for Ray Brown, a Thunderbirds model maker best known for his work on the mole. Mm. Clearly gifted at the mechanical side of model making, Ray was credited by Derek Meddings in a 1984 interview with coming up with a model aeroplane with a working jet engine oh <laughs> a jet wow. engine no less yeah so this model was an experiment uh, no doubt conducted in off hours or between series and it was never intended to appear on screen unless the tests proved successful in mm. which case the special effects artists were hoping to convince the writers to add it into a script so witnesses claimed it had a five foot wingspan oh and was designed to fly at 100 miles per hour cool. at altitudes as high as 20,000 feet. Wowzers. Yeah. That's uh, pretty good. I know. So Derek, it's a plane, basically. It, well, uh, uh, yes, but a small plane. <laughs> um, so uh, Derek alleged that a pair of twin engines uh, that could actually suck in air were mounted and the team gathered for a test flight. Mm. Unfortunately, oh. the model didn't fare too well. Uh, and reports vary between it didn't fly very far and it didn't get off the ground at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, okay. Right. Yeah. A bit uh, of a letdown. Now, but this was probably best because the fully functional high-speed miniature jet might have made filming more complicated rather than less, I suspect. Yeah, but true. nevertheless, it just proves uh, how committed the AP Films and Century 21 team were in their quest of getting the ideal perfect realism in miniatures yes <laughs> the yes. failed miniature jet engine experiment that's right <laughs> what a shame yeah bless them though bless them for trying yeah amazing I don't think any photos exist of this thing but if uh, if you know otherwise Podstrons do email yeah. us podcast at jerryanderson.com and yeah. do you know of any other working miniatures or other similarly adapted for real life objects that uh, were used in the production of Thunderbirds mm. or any other show let us know podcast at jerryanderson.com Nice. I like it. <laughs> so it's only a matter of time before they produce working miniature Jamie and Richards for the podcast. Well, oh, it might give us a little break. It might do, it might do. Yes. And our podcasts as well. Yes, uh, true. Yes. So there you go. Uh, Clever. Great, great work from Ray Brown with, with his failed miniature jet. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some other bizarre and equally fascinating fab facts in the future. But for this week, that is the end of this week's... Failed fact! Oh, I was going to go for jet fact, but uh, yeah, failed fact is good. Yeah, wow. Yeah, slightly more downbeat. But uh, yeah, no, I like that, it's good. I mean, it was... Clever chaps, it, it, it was a fab fact, that's for sure. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing, great. Uh, now, talking of clever chaps, some of them have been emailing us in at uh, podcast at jerryanderson.com. Yes, for example, this is from Leah, who says, Salutations. I just finished an assignment on why Jerry Anderson is the most underrated producer of all time Ooh. while listening to your latest episode. That was Pod 232. I have also enjoyed your recent intros in the last two weeks and have also been enjoying the standby for action concert on Spotify. And Aww. I used to watch Thunderbirds Saturday mornings with my dad at like 6 a.m. I hope you guys are enjoying your Day and enjoy your week, you three. Adios Aww. from Leah. That's nice. What a nice email. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, hi, chaps. Your Jamie the Gerbil shenanigans <laughs> last week, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, says Paul Hyder from China, reminded me that I had two pet gerbils as a child. <laughs> One right. was called Jerry the Gerbil, named after the man himself, Mr. Anderson, and the other was actually called Jamie the Gerbil. <gasps> but 
Jamie the gerbil was named after Jamie Summers, the bionic woman. Sorry, oh, Jamie. That's right. Best wishes from Paul. I don't yeah. know. I can pretend anyway. <laughs> that's great, isn't it? Uh, hi, Jamie and Richard. Hope you guys are well. At the time of writing this, it's just been the weekend after London Comic Con where I bought the standby for action CD and Blu-ray from you, having ah. been to the concert in April. This is from Joe. Joe says, I'm listening to the CD whilst writing this. And it brings back so many great memories from a terrific night. I wanted to write into the podcast for the first time to say thank you for taking the time to chat to me and for signing the items I had. And I'm looking forward to reading my copy of Intergalactic Rescue 4. Uh Uh, Since Thunderbirds is my favourite Anderson show, I was pleased to hear when talking to Chris and Ross that the current range of audio adaptations are selling well. However, something I mentioned to Chris uh, was since I own the original John Thaden novels, when reading the fourth book, Lost World, I was intrigued intrigued to see a T-Rex and a pterodactyl on the front cover, but was disappointed when no such creatures appeared in the novel. <laughs> I was hoping when the story gets adapted, they could be included. Maybe have them roaming in the background as Scott and the rest of the characters are wandering about. Also, I was wondering if Jamie could answer a question. If these audios continue to sell well, could we potentially see the Joan Marie Verber novels from the 2000s adapted? I believe these give us backstory to international rescue and they're very hard to come by. So I, for one, would definitely be interested in seeing them adapted. Thanks again. Keep up the great work. Kind regards, Joan. Interesting. Thanks, Joan. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad you're enjoying. Um, uh, the plans are not set for the next round of stuff. We've got a uh-huh. long line of things that we want to do probably before we'd even consider adapting more modern books. Okay. Uh, particularly yeah. with an eye of doing entirely new stories, perhaps. So oh, oh. Uh, never say never, but um, mm-hmm. and thank you for the feedback and we'll keep yeah. you in mind. Yeah. This is from Willow, I think, says, Hello, sirs, I've just recently found out that one of my old friends and fellow Roland Rat fans is also a Jerry Anderson fan and is listening to the podcast every week. Small world, eh? I don't know if he's ever written in, but I'd like to request a mention for Sam Dudman. He's a wonderful person, inspirational, and just an all-round lovely person. I think he deserves a shout-out. Thanks so much from Willow. Fair enough. Shout-out, Sam. That's right. And finally, this is from Liam Mahoney. Following your recent discussions about the possible inspiration for the Jeff Tracy puppet, (laughs) I looked up Lawn Green online and came across a website for greener weed-free lawns called Lawn Green (laughs) Now and get the lawn expert out to fix your lawn and weed problems. I really can't see, says uh, Liam, any similarity to Jeff Tracy at all. Also, it would appear that Mr. Green must have been Australian, not Canadian, as it's an Australian website. Then I realised my error and looked up L-O-R-N-E instead. In Scotland, by the way, lawn is a square sausage. And I must say, oh, yes. the resemblance is uncanny. What's and the that's square sausage? Mahoney. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who says he's still hoping for the uh, UFO The Vault, please? Yeah, well, never say never on that either. Yeah, that's right. There you mm. go. Uh, so do keep your comments, reviews, thoughts coming into podcast at jerryanderson.com because you know I'll read them out next time. You will. Of course I will. Undoubtedly. Yeah. I look forward to hearing them. Yeah. Uh, very good. Well, I see another lovely crop of emails this week. Isn't it nice? Thank you, Podstrons. We love hearing mm. from you. Please do continue to write in. One of the things they're often asking about is stuff that we end up covering in the Jerry Anderson News. So should we have some Jerry Anderson News. Oh, let's have some Jerry Anderson News. Then here with, uh, forthwith, immediately now, without further delay, is the Jerry Anderson News. Engage. It's the Jerry Anderson News. 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 Don't do that. News. 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 All right. Fine. Yes. Now, well, now you've done that to me. Let's get going with Jerry Anderson News. 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 Yeah. Here we go. So let's start with Christmassy stuff. I mean, it's all a bit Christmassy now, isn't it? Because it's December and everything goes Christmassy from the 1st of December or even the 1st of October, if you're WH Smith in Heathrow Airport. Uh, Anyway, Xmas posting dates. It's all a bit complicated because of the Royal Mail strikes and various things. If you're outside of the UK, then you probably wonder what I'm talking about. Well, uh, our postal service workers are quite regularly striking for better pay and conditions, which is uh, absolutely fair enough and on them. However, that does mean that there's a huge backlog of parcels and letters in the UK that have not uh, been processed and haven't been delivered. Royal Mail are currently telling us that there is approximately a seven day delay, seven working days. So if you've had a a notification that something is being sent, 
you need to add seven working days to that date before it's likely to arrive. Very frustrating for us and for you, but there's nothing we can do about it. We've tried juggling to other couriers. They're all very, very busy. Some of them even put their prices up in response to it. The backlogs are across the system and are unavoidable. So, if you want to get stuff in time for Christmas, I highly recommend you get everything you want ordered by lunchtime on the 12th of December. Uh, that is the day of release. It is quite possible that we will be able to get stuff to you on time and in a timely manner after that, but it's really tough to guarantee it. Even 24 hour and 48 hour services are taking eight or nine working days. And I can tell you at home here, we've not had a mail delivery for over a week. So um, it's a problem across the UK and obviously that then uh, impacts everywhere else as well. So that's all rather frustrating. Thank you for bearing with us and being kind to uh, Tim and Louise and Michael who are doing their best, but they're not magicians. And once stuff leaves us, we get very limited information. So it's really tough, uh, but hopefully things will sort them out, some themselves out before Christmas. If you're feeling a bit more festive in a sort of free youtube way then chris dale has done a fantastic top five christmas episodes oh. top five i can hear you asking there are only five jerry anderson christmas episodes well it's a ranking and uh, some of you are going to strongly disagree with chris's ranking but i'll leave it up to you to go and look up the top five jerry anderson christmas episodes more freebies bbc radio 3 uh, the show that i did with matthew sweet called the sound of cinema on the music of barry gray has just been replayed uh, the weekend before this podcast and is available on bbc sounds the sort of eye player of audio just search sound of cinema or barry gray and i'm sure you will find it now if you are looking to get hold of a technical manual be it Moonbase or shadow i have some bad news well, I mean, it's good and it's bad. Uh, Moonbase Alpha Technical Manual has sold out. Um, it is gone. We are due another print run, uh, which will arrive in mid-January. So I'm afraid that has switched back to pre-order. So if you're hoping to get on for Christmas, unless you are in the US where we have a few left, I'm afraid that opportunity is gone. Uh, the same with UFO's Shadow Technical Manual. Now we've got 430 on a pallet held up in amongst all the strike activity and all that sort of stuff. They hopefully will arrive at the warehouse shortly. A hundred and something of those have already been sold, so numbers are very, very low. So bear in mind that there may be a delay, but the product page will be updated with information about that. Maybe there, the Lost Stories of Space 1999 is due to ship any moment now. Should have shipped last week, but for some reason has been held up in our warehouse being unloaded. Um, we believe due to some sort of issue with the pallet and the size of the pallet, would you believe? Uh, and those of you who've ordered Intergalactic Rescue 4, that is shipping now and you should have it already or imminently. Uh, there'll be much more Christmassy stuff coming. Please bear in mind that uh, Richard and I will be recording ahead of time, won't we? Yes, oh, yes. we will. Uh, for the Christmas and New Year's episodes. So news may be incorrect, inaccurate, not timely or absent in its entirety. Uh, but... Uh, even we are going to have a little break over the Christmas period. So there we go. That's the end of this week's long list of things and uh, Jerry Anderson news. That was the news. That was the news. Great. Thank Great. You. Yeah. Nice. Lots of news. There's always lots of news. Not quite as much news as last week, I would say. Or maybe. No, that's true. But, yeah. Yeah, that was a, a mammoth <laughs> lump of news, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not very flattering, now, but okay. No. Uh, can I just shift your attention away from the news now All right. and towards our Facebook group? Yeah, please do. <laughs> Great, because it's a very friendly place full of people, well, like you, Jerry Anderson fans, but also not just Jerry Anderson fans, but fans of Jerry Anderson fans. Do you know what I mean? Fans of Jerry Anderson fans? What does yeah. that even mean? Well, it means, you know, they're all of a likeness. Okay. It's a lovely place to hang out. Our Facebook group, Tom Hodden. Ah, now I like it when he does this. He posted a link to one of those stories that sounds like a Jerry Anderson story. Uh, a secret unmanned US spaceship landed in Florida after circling the Earth for three years, sparking UFO fears and causing a sonic boom. After a record 900 days in orbit, the solar-powered X-37B landed at NASA's Kennedy Space Center on Saturday. Since the X-37B's first launch in 2010... It's shattered records and provided our nation with an unrivaled co capability to rapidly test and integrate new space technologies, says Jim Chilton, a senior vice president for Boeing. Its previous mission lasted 780 days. However, the surprise landing had some Floridians shell-shocked 
after a loud sonic boom was heard early Ooh. in the morning. That's very Thunderbirds, isn't it? It is. Cool, I like that. Uh, thanks for posting that, Tom. Andrea Boot says, My Spotify wrapped dropped today. Now, there's been a, quite a few posts about this over the yes. past couple of weeks. And I'm feeling very pleased to say, says Andrea, that you're my number one listen on podcast. Ah. How has it been 2,868 minutes of listening pleasure commuted to work this year? My clammy ears clearly can't get enough of all of you. Thank you for all you do. And here's to another 2,868 minutes next year. Cool. Right. Or more. That's right. Uh, Michael Gray says, uh, even amongst all of my random interests, such as football, Formula One, music, rugby, history, there was only one winner for my most played podcast of 2022 on Spotify. The Jerry Addison podcast. Hmm. Angus Dusk replied, well, same here. Every year, my Spotify listening habits seems to become more and more Anderson related. Paul Davis says, same for me. Turns out I'm also in the top 0.5% of Barry Gray listeners based on minutes sure. listened in 2022. <laughs> Isn't it? Um, here's a question from Scott Sadler. Hello, everyone. I don't know if I'm late to the party, but is there an Anderson Store Christmas jumper for sale this year? I've not seen any posts or adverts yet. Uh, no. They're not. They're not. So we had a couple of uh, designs from last year that were still in stock and I yep. think pretty much now sold out. So our next Christmas jumpers will be next year. We had intended to do one this year, but since we had a fair few of the previous year's ones, we thought we'd get rid of those first. Yeah. Um, and then nice. come up with something really lovely next year. Now, we did a little Christmas jumper competition earlier in the yeah. year, which we've had to delay the results uh, for. Okay. But there were some really great designs there. Lovely. And um, yeah, there'll be some special stuff next year. Okie doke. And finally for now, Keith Gooch says, I've said before, I don't like a week to pass without adding something to my Jerry Anderson collection, so I was delighted with today's delivery. Uh, that's a Stingray soundtrack CD from Jerry Anderson's store. Oh, and a past perfect annual from eBay, which focuses on the second series of TV21 comics, including Jerry Anderson and non-Anderson material. Good night's reading before Betty Boar's time, says Aww. Keith. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Uh, do let us know what you're buying or where you're buying it from. Uh, obviously, great if you're buying it from the Jerry Anderson store, but there's lots of vintage stuff that people are picking up on eBay and in various shops. So, yeah, we love to see those pictures too. We do. Doesn't matter where you get it from, what you get. No. As long as you're sure. keeping all things Anderson going with your collecting and passion, then we are very happy and it's good by yeah, us. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's good by us, not good by us. No, it's good as far as we're concerned. I, I see. Mean. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's good. Got yeah. Got it now? Uh, all for now but if you're on Facebook why not join our lovely podcast official listeners group it's quite easy two or three questions to answer we'll let you in and you can join in all the shenanigans shenanigans yes yeah. shenanigans gubbins any of yeah, these Victorian right. words all get applied yeah. to the Jerry Anderson podcast yeah would you like some more interview, Richard James? Because you're going to get some whether you like it or not. So preferably oh, like some. it. Yeah, Good. this is part two of uh, last week's interview. It is. It's more Peter Fantastic. Canick Adams. Uh, our expert in military history, our uh, uh, leadership um, um, uh, lecturer. Uh, he's just a general all-round nice chap. Uh, expert in all things military history. Also very, very keen on all things Anderson, uh, particularly of the vehicular variety. So okay, yeah. here's part two of two with Dr. Peter Caddick Adams. So I've got a question for you then, because everybody has their own opinions about Thunderbirds. Uh, you know, people who love it, they they will often cite a specific reason or reasons why they loved it or why they were so connected to it. And one which I hear quite often is, we loved Thunderbirds because of the puppets. I don't believe that is true. I think that's a sort of misattribution of of what was so good about it because it's something which makes it stand apart from other entertainment at the time and it's a thing you remember but i think one of the the secrets of it is that it, uh, it within seconds you're not thinking about the fact you're watching puppets you're watching as you say its own little world so you know you've you've already said you think the vehicles for you the thing that made it so were, were the puppets an important feature or could it you know it, what did they mean to you? Were they a barrier? Were they a meaningless aspect in terms of the medium in which it was produced? Was it fascinating? But, I mean, they're, they're all stereotypes in a way. Mm. Um, and so they're, uh, and, and, you know, as an adult, you look back on uh, and wonder about things like characterization and whether you can develop them as, uh, as, as individuals. And, and you can't in the time available, whereas mm. machines aren't sentient. So they can come in, they can do anything you want. Mm. Um, and as it's the future, they can defy gravity and, and, and all sorts of things. And, you know, to round it off, 
I mean, you've not just got great background dramatic music, but you've got fantastic names, Sidewinder, uh, Crab Logger, mm. um, you know, Fire Flash. I yep. mean, they're all really, really punchy. Exciting. And, and exciting. And you can't fail to sort of respond. Um, I remember watching one episode with a friend of mine who's exactly my age, and this was a long time ago, and his daughter came into the room, and she was, you know, really quite young. And there were these two sort of, you know, middle-aged guys watching an episode of Thunderbirds. <laughs> and it was right at the beginning. And I forget which one it was. Let's say it was sort of something like Crab Logger sort of thundering along. And she came in and she said, oh, dear, we all know it's going to go terribly wrong, don't we, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is yeah. these wonderful machines. And, you know, when you're very young, you think, well, of course, that's going to happen in the future. Of course, mm. we're going to have these great big things. And then you, you know, when you when you grow up and you look back, you think, what imagination, um, mm. just pushing the bounds of you know what was, and everything's got caterpillar tracks and and <laughs> and, and you know even even my royal engineer friends think I, I have this tussle every now and again with the Ministry of Defence. Why can't we have the mole or firefly, the sort of dozer with the cannon? Mm. Because that's what actually you need in combat, and, and Jerry Anderson's have got got there sort of 50 years before. Um, and there is a sense of, of you know, anticipation of, in some ways of you know where we are now. Mm. Tracy Island is, is Putin's lair. Mm. Every, you know, all the bad guys that the, the sort of uh, who are on earth, like the hood, you know, these are, you know, billionaires who, who've got far more money than sense who are trying to control the world um, and to do it by force. Mm. Um, and you know, all of a sudden, that that is the you know John Le Carre world in which we 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 live now. But there's no way you could have anticipated that in the 1960s because mm. it was all going to be peace and harmony. And that Coke advert, we're going to you know all everybody's drinking Coke all around the world of every different ethnicity. And you know, and and we are almost tripping into Star Trek, Star Trek territory, mm. where again you've got a united Earth. A, a, you know, Mr. Chekhov, the the, mm. the the token from the Soviet bloc. Yeah. So that problem is all solved. So I think there's a, there's probably a bit of Cold War by subterfuge going along going on certainly in Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Mr. Oh, absolutely. Lewis. Yeah. I mean, so, so much of the stuff is the contemporary reflections of things that are going on at the time. So, you know, the a- aliens harvesting organs in UFO was around the first time they were doing heart transplants and that kind of thing, and people were worried about what you know the significance of of an individual's organs and what it would mean so it's tapping into the the fear at the time that, the same for that Scarlet. I found absolutely fascinating because there were references there or hints of what we now know as sort of dna mm. um and that you could recognize an individual from their particular organs mm. and i don't think that was possible then but i mean now you know routinely that's how you would identify someone mm. And there's, it's just that feat of imagination of leaping forward 50 years hence mm. and thinking what might be possible and being brave enough to do that. Um, and you can shield yourself by saying it's a, you know, kids program, but you know, that time after time in every single series, there's, uh, there's, um, there's, there's a hint of that. Um, mm. and I think that's, you know, when you, when you grow up, you look back, that's one of the appeals. That's why, you know, these, um, these episodes, these, you know, all the different um, ideas, they ha- they, they've lost it so well mm. because they've come up with that, that generation. And, you know, you look now at the courage of actually pushing the bounds, not just of puppetry, not just of model making, not just the special effects and the music, but ideas. Yeah. And, and, you know, some of them have, have held water. An awful lot haven't. But, you know, that's the, the very best science fiction writers create a world. Uh, and, the, and, and the ones that have created the best worlds that have a, a modern echo are the names that we know, the sort of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. And yeah. that's what your dad is about. And that's mm. why, you know, he, he, you know, there'll be schools of, of you know, Anderson studies in, <laughs> in 50 years' time. There well, probably, I, there I probably so. isn't any university now, but I, I, I can quite see why there should be. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, the number of people who, who cite the direct influence, and you do see things that really got an early genesis or certainly uh, were added to the zeitgeist by those those shows like smartwatches and video calling and 
facial oh, no, recognition in the mighty atom yeah. i mean there's there's so many things which were enormous creative leaps and are now kind of every day uh some things that were big misses as well though i mean it, you you've been so full of praise it would be remiss of me not to at least say is there something you disliked or liked the least about thunderbirds in particular or any of the shows that you've kind of that's irked you well, if we go into the feature films, I, I thought um, Thunderbird 6 didn't quite deliver what we all wanted it <laughs> No, I think that's fair. <laughs> um, and um, Doppelganger seemed to be a, I mean, a full of wonderful sort of UFO type or, uh, ideas. Mm. But en- they, the end just seemed to, to hint that they'd run out of plot ideas. <laughs> Well, it's Doppelganger that inspired Dr. David Parker, who's the head of uh, human and robotic space exploration for ESA. So e- oh, really? even that and the mystery attached and the perhaps running out of plot still still managed to inspire somebody to go into uh, working in well, space. Well, European space agents, uh, space agency are fascinating. So I, I lecture around the world on leadership. And mm. I, did a, I did a panel for NATO in Milan just before the pandemic hit. And the uh, one of the, the guys from the European Space Agency was there, and he was talking about leadership on mm. the, the mission to Mars and, you know, how, how you've got to have a very special person who leads this yeah. mission because it's going to take two years to get there, and then you're establishing a colony and you're not coming back. Mm. And we went through all of that, and uh, guess what cropped up? Thunderbirds and the Mysterons. <laughs> Amazing. And, this was, you know, Supreme Allied Commander Europe was there. The <laughs> top generals. I kid you not, this is 2019 Amazing. in Milan. And, you know, there were more stars there than you could shake a stick at. And when um, Thunderbirds uh, and the Mysterons came up, uh, an UFO, um, because they all came into the mix with the ESA presentation. Yeah. Oh, uh, a sage nodding around the room <laughs> from these very senior and important NATO generals. Amazing. So there you are. You've got the entire Western world eating out of your hand. Okay, well, that's very pleasing. Uh, I, I shall have to try and turn that to my advantage somehow. Um, <laughs> so on the well, on the leadership note, then you've got these very strong father figure type characters, and we, you know, again in the documentary we discuss at great length the reasons why I think there are, there are these solo father figures, be they literal or, or not. But what do you think of the leadership style and abilities of Commander Shaw from Stingray and Jeff Tracy and Colonel White and uh, Ed Straker? Do they, do they share something that makes them feel as if they come from, from one person's mind or are they very different types of leaders? It's, it's difficult to recognize <laughs> that they all stem from one person's mind. I mean, I you know that that's the you know the, the Anderson achievement. Yeah, you know this is it's a the, you know your parents are a bit like um, you know the, the many lives of Winston Churchill. You 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 look at the the legacy and you mm. wonder how one person or a, a couple achieved all of that. Mm. So, I mean, UFO, I mean, the, the sort of the whole Ed Straker thing is, I mean, almost every episode is about leadership. Yeah. Personal leadership, yeah. Um, you know, your family, the rest of your team. And it's all about, you know, interaction of, of, of human relationships put under pressure by the Martians. Yes. Um, so, in a way, that's a natural development. Colonel White uh, and, and, and commanding Spectrum. I mean, again, there's 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 a lot of pressure on 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 the individuals. I mean, the cast is slightly what bigger than than Thunderbirds. Yeah, and he's he's dealing with these diverse elements, all of whom are drilled down in sufficient depth of character to to, to make a difference. So, though you you've got all the angels, but you've got all the sort of spectrum captains um, mm. and Lieutenant Green and 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 all the rest of it. So, Colonel White's got to do his his thing, and it's, what's the um. There's one episode where cloud base comes under attack and it mm. ends up as a dream, but, but yes. it's very realistic. And, and there's Colonel White doing his sort of, you know, staying at his post right until the end. Yes, as the ship um, goes down. <laughs> yeah, I mean Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Tracy, I, I suppose, is the 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 obvious one. Mm. Um, but it, it's his family, whereas Commander Shaw is a military leader. Yeah, running the team build. 
and he is, you know, apart from the fact his daughter is is is, is there helping. But he's commanding all these people who've just been promoted through the the, the, the WASP security patrol into Marineville, and so mm. they're not there for uh, any sort of family reasons. And and he is the old war dog with his cigar in his mouth all the time. And I mean that's a very 1950s American stereotype, absolutely sort of like pattern, or possibly even the the generals or air marshals from Doctor Strangelove. Mm. Which is you know, just before that sort of era. Yeah. Oh, so I, I would think have certainly all, drawn on that. I think, so I think there are all sorts of reference. I mean, this is the other thing which which I, I I think of. There are all sorts of reference points all the way through all the episodes that strike a chord with adults. And although the the series are can you know primarily aimed at a kids market, I, I think there was always a desire for you know the father of the family to come in and sit down and suddenly start watching with the brood and think, Oh yes, uh, I recognize that. And that makes sense to me. And as the, as the, uh, as the shows mature uh, and the, the challenges and the leadership issues develop, I think he's also tagging that, that older parental group as well. Yeah. So I think, yes, it's, it. That that's another of the, the, the sort of brilliances because it works on several different levels. And I can tell you, Dad would be very pleased to hear you say that because that was certainly one of his aims was not to speak down to the audiences to bring them with you. And we've heard from realize. yeah, we've, and it was very much his, his desire that you know, ki- even now, kids don't really want to watch stuff that is made for them. They want to watch the thing that Absolutely. they're not quite able to or is slightly older. And then the thrill of having you know, a parent or a grandparent sit down. And we we know multiple fans who we've had on the, the podcast where it would be the sort of three generations sitting down together and making a big family thing of it. And that's that's quite something and something which is almost actively discouraged in entertainment these days. Everything is very, you know, this is a a show for four to six year olds or seven to nine year olds. Oh, yeah, or, very, very market segment. Yeah. Um oriented. And to their um, to their detriment, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I do, I do a lot of military communications. So you're you're talking about target, target audience analysis, which is mm. very very precise um, mm. in terms of message, and that's just not there in the 1960s. No. To sort of throw paint at the wall and sort of see what happens. Mm. But also, I'm not aware really that he's pushing pushing a message. I mean, you you could easily you could easily overlay a sort of um, evangelical Christian message to uh, to uh, Americans through Captain Scarlet or mm. something similar through UFO, or you could have put a message in with um, uh, international rescue. And there's no attempt to do that. You could have had a message at the end. And there's, no, there's, there's, there's none of that. And I think, I mean, it may be because um, as you say, kids don't like to be consciously talked down to. Mm. And treated as adults. So this is, you know, this is the adult world that you welcome to the adult world that you will experience when you grow up. Yeah. And you know, there's an element of that, and I think that's 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 what make makes it so exciting. Um, we'll let you into this secret. This is what you you know, this is what life is going to be like for you in the future. So you know, prepare for, prepare yourself for it. But your teachers won't know that, <laughs> and they might be Mister Arms anyway. So uh, don't tell them. No, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of that, isn't it? It's it's a very good way of of um, of talking about other people, you know, by reference to to a, a sort of third party on on the television. Mm. You know, if we talk about um, General Melchett or Captain Blackadder, mm. we've got shorthand for, for instant stereotypes. Yeah, and I think that's what you know, particularly Thunderbirds gives us. You know, the moment you say the hood. You, you can think of that sort of evil or, or, or Captain Black, but the hood particularly with his eyes. Um, yeah. And um, Tintin or, or Toy Tempest or whoever. So, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, that, that's another lasting legacy, certainly for our generation. Hmm. The, the stereotypes, which, which actually mean other people as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very pleased that, you know, that as you reported, these things have stuck with, lots and lots of people in all sorts of different roles in a very very positive way i mean if if there was only one anderson show that you could share with friends and colleagues for a bit of a nostalgia trip is it going to be thunderbirds 
you're going to ask me to desperately prove why it shouldn't be fun. <laughs> hey, if you've got another suggestion, Peter, I'm up, I'm up for it. But uh, I'm, I feel like that might be the way you lean. I, I mean, it's, it's certainly the way I lean. I have to say, I mean, I'm I'm talking to you from Croatia, which is my Tracy Island. This is my mm. lair where I I spend you know quite a lot of the year thinking and writing and uh, and broadcasting. And I, you know. It, Odd moments, YouTube delivers all sorts of wonderful Anderson feasts for me. Um, I'll hear it. I'm drawn more back to, to UFO. Um, ah. the, yeah, yeah, the funky music, which is yep, of course. Intros and, 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 and uh, exits from that show are absolutely brilliant. Taking yep. the eyeball to the, you know, the Martian. Tell me why, though, you, you've got three craft based on the moon that have a single missile. <laughs> and the moment they fire that missile at a UFO, they're completely useless. Yeah. They don't have any secondary armament. And they've only got one missile. Where does that come from? I mean, that's uh, just. I, I think it's aesthetic and drama over function. <laughs> I mean, we, so we, we've just, uh, we're, well, we, we are in the process of now publishing a, a book, the UFO Technical Operations Manual, uh, oh, yeah, no, which I, I will send a copy to Croatia for you. And in there, we have the answer to why there's only one. But I, I can't give it to you uh, on this uh, unsecured channel. We'll have to, well, have that's to fine. communicate uh, well, on an encrypted one later. Security channels and ab- <laughs> absolutely. But my friends, <laughs> my my logistician friends, love the Eagle Transporter. They say yes. it's you know the best designed logistics vehicle ever. Mm. And there've been some versions of it now that have been camouflaged in NATO camouflage. Um, mm. So they they. Those are put up in uh, in military presentations around the world. You'll be pleased to know. So, Amazing. Twenty so. first yeah. century production, you know, has, has, has did, did not die a death a long time ago. It, no, it still is part of ongoing military m- military operations even today. It, it, it is amazing. Uh, now, Peter, I hope that you, we will see mentions of Anderson things in future publications from you and other talks. Are you going to keep flying the flag for all things Anderson for us? Oh, I mean, totally. I mean, you you, you picked me. We, we tripped over one another on on uh, on Twitter. Um, yep. Whether Twitter, you know, carries on in, in the current in its current form, we we, we do not know. But Who knows? Um, I inject Thunderbirds into a lot of my lectures, um, hmm. and I think they've cropped up in one of my military history books as Amazing. a sort of analogy. Fantastic. I mean, writing in its in its purest form is all about word pictures. Mm. Uh, and if you can if you can fling a few words together to create a much much larger more detailed picture then you've got your audience eating out of your hand you're reading yeah. and you know thunderbirds probably more than any other because it was so international it's had so many repeats so it's not just one generation actually does that extremely well yeah. um, you know stereotypes apart and so it works in so many different contexts so it you know it, it it's a military operation. I mean, logistically, you wonder how on earth Tracy Island can run with only brains <laughs> servicing it. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know you, you, that that only strikes you sort of much much later on. And I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a, a magical Anderson reason as to how it all manages to 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 uh, to, to take over, relying only on brains. But, but yeah, there we go. Um, but it's such a pure, self-contained world where you know most. Most questions that, that would occur to a ten-year-old, let's say, are, are dealt with. Mm. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean that—that—that's the enduring series of all the different uh, selections are on offer. But I mean, I, you know, I go back to the original point. I, I do feel shortchanged. You know, right from Fireball XL5, you know, we were going to be roaming the um, the universe. Yeah. Um, with without spacesuits, just... oxygen pills are all you need, as it turns out. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, so what, you know, what's that you, you, Yeah, but you the various series ranged underwater as well. Mm. You know, Stingrays a lot about that. There's a few Thunderbirds episodes. The aliens had bases underwater as well. Mm. So, you know, it ranges through every different sort of permutation that you can think of. Uh, and if you st- stuck with the series, and I think that's no, I mean that's another thing. You, as you grow up, you you moved on to a more um, innovative Anderson idea, um, and so you progress to UFO or to Space Nineteen Ninety Nine. Yeah, there was always um, somewhere to go. 
absolutely. And so that's that's why the whole you know package never really lost people. And if you're taking if you're taking people from I don't know age five, six, or seven, right through until they're teenagers, and you've got them for about ten years of their most formative years of their mm. lives. I mean, that's what your dad was doing. Yeah, because you know that that those episodes you know cross because there's about ten years, there's at least ten years of, of allegedly kids' entertainment. But it it it, it mm. it's aimed, I think, all the time at a slightly older market segment each yeah. time. And so, you know, that's that's the winning formula. That's why we're still buying into this. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was a 15 year period where it really grew with you. And if you were you were in amongst that, then I think you're kind of set for life on your Anderson journey. And and you yeah, appear and you to be one that. of those victims. Well, I, I, totally, totally victimhood. But I mean, the marketing, <laughs> you know, really comes into play. So you know, how many people didn't have a, a dinky you know, Anderson craft or whatever or Airfix or all the various other um, model makers who came up with the, the craft. Um, even my fab ice lolly, I can remember. <laughs> Which and is I still mean, going now, now. Really? You can still get a fab ice lolly, absolutely. You're joking. Yeah, God, I yeah. know we did. Well, not in Croatia. No, so. not in Croatia, but I'll, next time I see one, probably not now, not the weather for it, I'll have one for you. Oh, gosh. Well, that's another reason to rush back to Blighty. God, God. No idea about that, but I, I mean, you know, we we think now of licensing with you know Harry Potter in every sort of conceivable form, but I think then that was you know probably quite innovative, and and you know that that's you know just opening up all those commercial opportunities mm. that then reinforce the message and the brand. Just um, is it, something else that we were um, all victims of. Yeah, well, there you go. That, so that department was run by Keith Shackleton, who Dad met when he was at RAF Manston, and they, he was his oh, really? only only friend he made during his RAF days because he hate, he hated everybody else. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. So, yeah, so, the, so, the RAF right, boys so done good. Overtones, yeah, so the military overtones really, really work. Yeah, and of course the military love Thunderbirds because the uh, who was it? The Royal Marines adopted the Thunderbird March. Yeah, and in fact, every, I think all three services now. Routinely have the Thunderbirds march in their, you know, in their parades and their broadcasts. Amazing, yeah. I, I mean, mean so how how many people can say that they've written a commercial tune for a kids' program or even e e even an adults' program on television that they, then gets embraced by you know military services and becomes a st standard fare that everybody. Wants? It's it's amazing, isn't it? Amazing influence. And as, in fact, when we had our concert earlier in the year, John Colshaw said if. The Thunderbirds March had been written a hundred years earlier. It probably would be, would have been our national anthem, <laughs> and I like the idea of that very much. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, Barry Gray's genius is is that you know, in that context, he became a a, a, a British version of Sousa with Liberty yeah. Bell, if you like. Um, mm. And you know, it, it's, uh, it's 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 a racing. I mean, it's just a bracing. Well, I've marched to it, so I can, I can tell you from a user's perspective, brilliant, rather than you know a player's perspective. It is a great tune to march to, and your 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 back sort of stiffens and your arms swing. Not just because it's a good march, but you know you listen to it as a kid, and it actually means something far more than just you know the notes or the melody. Um, and you know that has a and it, so you know the whole world of special effects, the music, the script, the characterization, oh, the models, the models, the models, just just make this incredibly potent package. You know, and that that's why it's still going strong. That is uh, an excellent summary. It's not just one thing. It is it is the whole package. Um, so, yeah, but we couldn't put it better myself, Peter. Uh, Peter, I can see our time rapidly marching away. So is there anything else that you are working on currently that listeners can keep an eye out? And uh, where should they find you on on all things social media? Well, I, I I broadcast a lot on Twitter where I'm military history um, ending in an I rather than a Y. I write books about principally Second World War military history. Mm. And as we've discussed, I, I've made the odd allusion to, to Thunderbirds, <laughs> Jerry Please Anderson. Keep doing it. Um, through those, I will. I will. <laughs> um, my last book was just was about the, the end of the Second World War in the West. It's called Victory in the West, and this is... The, um, an overview of what happens in 1945 um, for the Allies. Um, but I've just signed a contract uh, yesterday for my next book, which is Triumph in the West, which is the last year of the First World War in oh, 1918. Amazing. 
So the struggle there is going to be <laughs> to, to, to bring in Captain Scarlet or Stingray <laughs> into the First World War. But, but now as a result of our conversation, I'm going to have a, a jolly good try. And, and, and I know the weight of expectation will be so great that, that um, if, uh, if, if Joe 90 or the Tracy family don't manage to make it into 1918, I'll eat my hat. Okay, fantastic. Well, you've got thousands of podcast listeners now who will be making sure to follow up on that. So uh, I'm afraid essentially that's a verbal contract. So we look forward to reading those mentions in the next book. <laughs> uh, it will Peter, be my pleasure and delight. Yeah. Okay, I will. I can't wait. And Peter, it's been really, really great chatting to you. A really different perspective to so many chats that we have on here. And uh, yeah, a, a really succinct and top-notch description of why Thunderbirds is still going strong. And uh, I look forward to hearing future iterations of... Uh, how it crops up at NATO and other meetings in the future. Well, hopefully we'll chat again. Jamie, I've really, really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. My inner child has bubbled up to the surface and had great fun. Thank you. Love it. The power of Anderson. Thanks, Peter. A very enjoyable chat, and I could have chatted for another good hour or so. I bet. um, At the very least. So do tweet, Peter. He's a very active Twitterer. Mm. And you can find him at Military History, where the last Y of history is replaced by an I. Yes. So M-I-L-I-T-A-R-Y-H-I-S-T-O-R-I. Mm. Got it? Okay. Yeah, got uh, it. He'll yeah. be tweeting vociferously, no doubt. Is that the mm-hmm. right word? That's a word, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. V- vociferously? Yeah. Can you tweet vociferously? I don't know. You can oh, well. now. Yeah, fair uh, And if you're interested in military history, then Peter's book, Victory in the West, about the end of World War II, is just one of his countless books that oh. are available from all good booksellers. Great. I should look out for them. Thank you. Very Peter. nice. Uh, any news on who we've got coming next week, or is that a top secret? It's top secret. We do, ah. I, uh, Actually, no, it is yeah. top secret. I know who's coming, oh. and I think it's going to be a rather lovely one. But, um, oh, okay. Great. And I, I think the said interviewee, says nice things about you in it believe it or not get away and about me oh fair enough so good. yeah yeah good clearly n- uh, not right are they i mean we know he's <laughs> talk about this don't we because Do we? uh it's well it's that time of year isn't it where it's um you know it's time to roll out the old you know the bearded pun master for a very terry christmas isn't is, it is it isn't it? Are we doing that? Oh, but should we do that? A very Terry Christmas? I, I, I suppose so, yes. We could think about it, couldn't we? Yeah, it, it may have around. to appear via video link uh, or vid phone, possibly. <laughs> yes, um, we shall see. We we'll shall see how the timing works. Yes. But uh, yes, it is that time of year. Uh, mm. Just a reminder that uh, if you want to be guaranteed in the UK to get your stuff, today is pretty much the last day to be super, super guaranteed delivery in time for Christmas. Um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, the 15th is really your absolute last. And the 19th, if you really, really want to push it around the world, definitely want to get done by today if you're in Europe and elsewhere. You may have missed it unless you're in the US and you want to order directly from the Jerry Anderson store in the USA. So jerryanderson.store, up to you. But there we go. And there's there's gift cards available if you're looking for a last minute gift for a, an Ander fan, a fellow Ander fan. But uh, mm-hmm. there you go. Good. Yeah, nice. Uh, now, over on Twitter, people yes. are still hashtagging us jerry anderson podcast still i know uh tagging me richard and james and you i'm jamie anderson and him chris Dalek. now for example jeff cope says i've been on a jerry anderson kick recently and having a blast which includes jamie anderson and richard james's wonderful jerry anderson podcast oh that's nice that's isn't it fiona moore now this is interesting this week in i watch space precinct so you don't have to <laughs> jerry anderson turns political with a bit of corporate satire and the series gains a new recurring villain or does it and she's posted a link to a review for an episode called The Snake. Oh, yes. Which apparently, as she says in the article, the Radio Times teased as uh, the snake being a returning or recurring villain. Did they? They d- Apparently so. Which, of course, can't be true because we, you know, spoilers, but we do see him he explode l- in l- the depths of space. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's a thought. Now, she also includes in her review a special mention for Zill. Uh, the, the Brogan's family pet that made me laugh. She says, this thing is a horribly fake-looking animatronic monkey parrot creature that you just know someone thought would be a great idea and a hit with merchandising, but actually none of the scriptwriters have the faintest idea what to do with it. Yeah, it made that horrible <laughs> noise, didn't it? Yes! 
yes. and then yeah, Vivid Imaginations cool. were going to make a toy. I remember that being teased right. and, all the, and all the material, and then they never made they it. Went, nah, actually, we'll leave that. That's rubbish. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Starburst magazine tweeted, Stand by for action, a celebration of the music of the classic shows created by Jerry Anderson. Recorded live in concert is out now, and they posted a link to their five-star review. Yeah, it's a lovely review. Thank yeah, you, Starburst. May I, uh, could I just read a tiny oh, little please snippet? please do. Well, Starburst say, if the live concert itself was a shot of pure undiluted nostalgia, and it was, then this new Blu-ray release is a permanent reminder of a very special event and a very special occasion. Anyone brought up in the 60s who enjoyed the heyday of Jerry Anderson and Century 21 Productions can't help but be transported effortlessly back across the decades to a simpler, kinder and more optimistic world by standby for action. There you go. Isn't that nice? Yeah, lovely. And I'd agree with all of that. Of course I would. And finally on Twitter, Andrew Barrett tweeted, any Joe 90 audio box sets in the works with Big Finish? Mm, Well, well. I think that quite unlikely. Okay. And that's not me... You yeah, know, my personal you. taste. That's yeah. not being me. But, you know, in terms of popularity and, and wider appeal, you know, we'd be looking at things like Stingray and Scarlet and probably even Fireball before Joe 90 in terms of popularity. So um, that gives you an idea of where it kind of sits in the popularity stakes and thereby when we might consider it. But, um, you know, you've got the, the audio annual version in uh, Anything Can Happen if you want to have a bit of a Joe, Joe, Joe 90 story. Yes, that's right, exactly. Better than nothing, isn't it? It's, it's there for you if you want it. Exactly that. <laughs> yeah. Good, that's all for now. Uh, Is it? But do keep, yeah, keep tweeting us and keep emailing us and keep Facebooking us. Keep subscribing. Keep leaving your lovely ratings. That's a review and a rating if you've just joined us. Uh, five stars if possible and a few words uh, about why you enjoy the podcast so much. Just make something up if you don't really enjoy it. Uh, and also, of course, keep posting links on all your socials because, you know, we like to have more listeners. And they're growing all the time and they're from all over the world and it's a lovely community. It is a super lovely community. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, uh, Speaking of super lovely things. Oh, yes. Uh, well, there's two lovely things coming up. One is Chris Dale and the other is his randomizer. Oh, yeah, that's true. Both are somewhat uh, mutually inclusive, not exclusive. Um, I don't yeah, know what okay. they are. Yeah, yeah, anyway, no, no, I know what you mean. They come hand in hand. They do. Uh, basically, Chris has a device called the randomizer and he uses it to choose a random Jerry Anderson episode from a random series and he watches it and says fantastically interesting and entertaining and funny things. And yes. that's what he's going to do right now Good. in this week's randomizer. Over to you, Chris. Where are we going? I don't know. It depends on the randomizer. What? Uh, well, it's called a uh, randomizer and it operates under a very complex scientific principle called potluck. Yes, that's right, Doctor. Hello, everybody. You join Marina and myself aboard the TARDIS for a very exciting experiment. Yes, the plan is that by linking the randomizer to the TARDIS, we'll not only get a random episode selection, but we'll actually get to visit a place related to that episode itself. Isn't that right, Doctor? Exactly, good heavens. That's exactly right. Thank you. Now, if I may. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, I've always wanted to do this. Right, here goes. What do you think our chances are, Doctor? Randomizer is a useful device, but it lacks true discrimination. <gasps> oh, don't listen, old girl. Well, you know how dangerous it is bypassing the randomizer. Oh, nonsense. When has doing that ever backfired on me before, eh? We've arrived. What? I said we've arrived. We got there. <laughs> Marvellous. Shall we uh, go out and take a look? Oh, well, that's uh, ooh, a bit nippy. Not the most inviting planet. No. No, but uh, I do have the feeling I've been here before. What is it? Is it something you recognise? Oh, yes. Yes, something from long ago. A sense of dread and, and ancient evil. Look! Ruins of a city? Oh, yes! Yes, of course! We're on Xanadu! And that is the remains of the domed city of the Kudus creatures beneath which once stood the frozen fountain of eternal life! Shall we go back inside? Yes. But... Hey, wait a minute, hold on! Oi! Oh, hey, hey, Doctor, you can't just. Oh. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, well, I'm sure they'll be back for us oh, momentarily, Marina, but until then, should we watch uh, Last of the Xanadus? Yes, and, uh, oh, can I borrow the scarf in a little bit? Oh, come on, please. Oh. 
Well now, how appropriate it is that as we approach the end of the year, we get a, a very chilly, very cold episode with Last of the Xanadus as we open on, indeed, the frozen planet of Xanadu. And this lovely little ice palace model um, just pops out from under the surface. And inside, well, we can hear some voices and immediately a very unsettling atmosphere is created here. Not just this chanting, but these... These paintings around the room, these are um, previous, in, uh, I guess, kings of Xanadu. Uh, they look quite similar to the paintings that Keith Wilson did for the um, in Balor's cell in uh, End of Eternity. There is a definite sort of lineage here, so I'm wondering if these paintings are, are his creation. Oh, voices! Of my ancient ancestors. There's one of them which is a, an un, it bears an uncanny resemblance to um, David Bowie, which is quite interesting. The fires that will get us rid of the space rodents, the hated lazoons, forever. Yeah! And here's uh, an interesting chap. His name is Kudus. Uh, he is the last survivor of the Kudus race, so his name is also the name of his race. Enough my levitosis virus. And he is, uh, he's, well, he's developed a, a virus that will kill the uh, species that has brought the Xanadu race to the point of extinction. We are, of course, referring to... Known to another. The Lazoons. Everyone is destroyed. Because who knew that uh, Zuni and his brethren were... Uh, Sisters will be avenged. ...had the capability to uh, to commit genocide. You may joke about such things, but, you know, that is what this story is presenting. Uh, the, the, the Zoons were vermin that overran the world of Xanadu. Oh. And uh, what you may not get from that little speech that Kudus gave there is uh, the fact that the people he was talking to, those chanting voices, were all on tape. Because Kudus really is the last survivor of his race, but he has recordings of his ancestors chanting his name. And just that setup, coupled with this creepy music and the paintings and the freaky boggle-eyed look of the Kudus puppet, there's a very unsettling atmosphere created very early on in this episode, which is very nice, and it will continue. Dear, my hair, it's just like space weed. Oh, okay. Look at you, Zuni. Well, oh, Zuni scrubbed up quite well. Come on! He's got a little bow tie on. He does look very smart. You look a real cute toot, Zuni. Oh, dear. And Venus's hair doesn't look too bad. It doesn't look space weed. Oh, dear. No begging for scraps. If you behave yourself... We'll give you some Martian delight you like so much. Ah, well, that's something for, uh, that's an incentive to keep Zuni behaved and uh, not off causing space genocide. Meanwhile, at Steve's apartment, with the groovy music. Ah, Venus is doing the cooking. Oh, because of course she is. For your guest, Steve. Great, Venus. She's a woman, after all. Major Ireland is really going to enjoy his first night back on Earth. Ten years is a long time. And if not, thank God there's that new McDonald's that just opened around the corner. Should really entertain more often. Everybody in Space City is envious of it. Okay, Venus. I'll entertain more often on one condition. And that is? You do the cooking. Oh. Oh, she's made a rod for her own back there. Personal intercall, Steve. Yes, everyone likes Steve's apartment, which uh, I believe he moved into at some point during the course of the series. I think it was Space Pen he moved in there. You're coming down. Be right with you, Commander. Over and out. Major Island here already. Ooh. But I haven't even started to get changed yet. Despite the fact that I was in front of the mirror just now. They have electronic dishwashers, but women? They haven't changed one bit since the 1960s. Oh, I'm a sexist pig, but it's in an era that it's okay for me to say such things. Thank God that'll never change. Oh dear, that is a fairly... I mean, among the show's many examples of... Um, quite striking sexism that line just is, is one of the uh, the all time classics my goodness anywho Space City is welcoming the arrival of a spaceship um, surprisingly enough uh, the EX-10 and at the controls is Major Ireland I presume Major Jim Ireland old son of a space gun ah, gee it's good to see you he's an explorer a space explorer my place Venus is a wonderful cook. Venus? Oh, of course. You won't have met her. She's only been on the team five years. Huh. Her five-year mission to do really good cooking and the washing up. You always knew how to pick them, young Zodiac. 
Do you mind if we unload my gear from the hold, Steve, before we... So, yes, Major Island has been away for a very long time. Experience on Space Safari have taught me never to leave your kit. Not even for a night. And I like that he's wearing a uniform that's sort of similar to the XL5 and, and Space City crew, but it, it looks slightly older. <sighs> what has happened to Steve? Oh, the dinner will be ruined. Well, I must say I sure could eat right now. It smells so good, Venus. Thank goodness he has you to come into his house and cook all his food for him. No, without him. I have an arrangement like that. It's called a wife. That's the lot, Steve. Are you sure I've collected a lot of stuff when you're years away from Earth? Hmm. Yes, I, I like the, the implication that he's, he's been all over the place. He's seen all sorts of things. But also, in the, the cabin of his ship there, you could see those like plates and things scattered around as he's been living, not rough, but, you know, he's been living alone, so he doesn't really have to, uh, to keep the place tidy. Meanwhile, back on Xanadu, our... Great news! All my ancestors. Our friend Kudus. The conditioned messenger has reached Earth. Is talking to his tape recorded ancestors. I find this just so creepy. And I've always found this episode a very creepy one. Slazone will be infected with a myelomatosis virus. Right from the, the first time I saw it. Oh, my ancestors, see. Across the infinite light years of space. I bid you. See. Yes, I, I, oh, I have a very clear memory of this this episode. I, I first saw it again as I'm sure I've mentioned this. I had uh, volumes four and six of Fireball XL Five on VHS. This was on volume four. There. Volume four was the first time I ever saw the series, and it was just oh, I got it for Christmas one year that tape, and it was just one of the best Christmas presents I ever got. I wish I'd held on to it. Um, we've now covered, I think, three of the four episodes that were on that tape. Of all the zones is at hand. And this was the final one on the tape, so it was a very spooky way to end it. Of the great Kudos Emperors, have sworn it to And David Graham's doing some wonderful acting here, not just as Kudos, but... Kudos! Obviously, he's he's one of the voices on that tape. I, I would have to assume uh, that that's him and, and John Bluth all together. John Bluthall is also playing Jim Island. Boss, the jungle planet. Oh. When did you videotape these shots, Jim? Have we been there, Matt? Years ago. I was there for quite a time. Zuni's fallen asleep. Quality picture for a portable videotape machine. Yeah, some fine shots. Pretty rough country. And where else has he been? Oh. Xanadu. But nobody's ever dared to set foot on that planet. Except me. And what's I'm so brave. actually been inside the dome. There it is now. Yes, he's got footage of Kudus's control room, and not only that, but Kudus himself making a speech. And wouldn't you know it, <coughs> this is the point Zuni decides to wake up. And he recognises one of his, uh, well, I was going to say um, uh, most sort of feared figures, but actually, you know, if the Lazoons wiped out the Kudus people, then uh, maybe Zuni is a bit embarrassed. Of his association with the genocide. I'm so sorry, Major. I should have known not to show that sequence while he was in the room. Oh, yes, a man making a speech. Aren't the Xanadus sworn to rid the universe of Lazoons? Um, yeah, they're doing a really good job of that. Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah, Zuni right. knocked the tape off. Xanadu was once overrun by wild Lazoons, and the coolest creatures were almost destroyed by them. I, I wonder, though, about the, the Lazoons running over, uh, overrunning uh, the planet of Xanadu, because it's a frozen waste. Bah, sir. A touch of the old space. Did the Lazoons evolve there naturally? Did they arrive on a spaceship that they hijacked? I don't know. To help you sleep. Oh, no, no, no. No, please don't trouble. It's, an, it's, an, it's a strange part of a very strange story, the idea that the Lazoons were somehow responsible for genocide. The dinner were most clear. Good night, everyone. Anywho, Major Island is... Uh, well, he's a bit tired. Fine man, the Major. Been through a great deal. Hmm. Is it true, Steve, what he said about that odd character on Xanadu and the Lazoons? Yes, it's true, all right. You're harboring a uh, genocidal maniac, Venus. Xanadu is a long way off. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. Oh, and um, Zuni has helped himself to... Oh, maybe he's helped himself to a bit of it, or maybe he's just uh, making eyes at the Martian delight that he was promised. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Colonel Zodiac's apartment, I guess he's hosting Jim Ireland for the night. But Jim Ireland can't get any sleep. Voices in his head are keeping him awake again. And this is a very creepy shot. Who 
is just materialising at the foot of, of Ireland's bed. And Ireland is, is just so static in his expression. He doesn't blink, but his eyes are barely moving as well. It's all a bit sort of Captain Scarlet-y, this. Among Earthmen, Major Ireland have seen the secret of Xanadu. Because Major Ireland did not escape Xanadu. You must pay the price. Unaffected. Whatever you will be the slave of Kodos. Oh, he's been enslaved. Go now and accomplish your mission. Your appointed mission. Oh, don't get the camera any closer, he's freaky. Destroy the Earth It's, again, going back to the idea of the Lazoons and the, Xana uh, the Kudus as mortal enemies. It's strange that you would have such an effectively unsettling and even, you know, dare I say it, chilling villain and um, their obsess their one obsession is exterminate Zuni. <laughs> but, you know, apparently the Lazoons have, have wrought terrible damage against his people, driven them to the point of extinction. I don't know what they did. They just sort of showed up, made made a few noises, and all the Kudus creatures just decided to kill themselves out of just sheer frustration. Anywho. Someone is sneaking into Venus's apartment. <laughs> spotted the Martian delight on the table. So Zuni didn't get it after all. Um, I guess he was a naughty boy knocking the camera off the table. Oh, Martian delight, if you're wondering, it looks like fudge. Because Jim Island has just opened it up and uh, placed a few drops of... Oh no, okay, he wasn't at Venus's apartment, that was at Steve's apartment. They left the Martian delight there and he is now taking it to Venus's beach house on his uh, hover bike thingy, jetmobile even. And while Venus sleeps, and Zuni sleeps, Major Ireland lets himself in because I guess nobody in Space City locks any of their doors. And why should they? They all know each other. <laughs> oh, Zuni gets the wah wah music even for just lying there asleep. He wasn't doing anything, but this has woken him up arrival of Jim Island in a snazzy uh, dressing gown holding some Martian delight that Zuni loves so much left it by his basket Zuni, Zuni sleeps in a basket that's quite sweet and of course by next morning that Martian delight is gone um, I mean probably realistically within about two minutes that Martian delight was gone and Zuni is not looking well Oh, Zuni, you naughty boy, stealing a box of Martian delight. What have you got to say for yourself? No regrets. Zuni? Hmm. He's not moving. Zuni? What's the matter? Oh, dear. Feeling better this morning, Jim? Not so good. It's my head. Uh, and the voices in it have been very loud all night. You should take it easy. You've gone through a lot these past ten years. Yep, it's been tough, all right. My God, we'll talk about how wonderful I am later on. In fact, uh, this character was one of the inspirations for uh, a character in one of my Terrorhawks episodes, actually. Uh, um, Elias Crick, was that the name of the explorer in, um, in the third series that David Graham played? I just love the idea of a space explorer, and it's something that this episode um, did, but not many, not many others in the Anderson universe. But how could he have caught it? He's caught myelomatosis. Lazoons for over 50 years. Then oh. the virus must have been brought in. Earth lazoons, so there are... Mm, brought in deliberately, perhaps. Could it be something he's eaten? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. The Martian delight. That you found next to his basket. The Martian delight? How did you not put it together, Venus? Only one person, Kudos, who swears to destroy lazoons throughout the universe. Well, I think there's more than one person who's sworn to destroy Zuni. No, Earthman has. Except... But let's go with it. Except Jim Ireland. He must be in the power of Kudos. Hmm. How horrible. Oh, that's so nasty, Stephen. Really mean. The antidote. There must be one. We've got to make Ireland tell us. Well, no time for that. XL5 is taking off. I just love the sudden cut from them chatting to this. What's happening? We're taking off. Fireballs, take it off, Commander. But they've had no clearance. This is most inconvenient, Lieutenant. I have a mission to accomplish. This is quite funny as well. I have no will of my own. 
No will of my own. So Major Ireland is at the controls. I just love the fact that he says, I have no will of my own. And Robert, who definitely has no will of his own, just mindlessly repeats, no will of my own. No, my... And yeah, he's just repeating everything that Ireland is saying. Why, he'll kill him. He can't handle a ship like Fireball. Well, he's doing all right so far. And of course, he's got Robert with him. Hold on, Venus. I'll get to the main control cabin. Don't worry, Venus. I'll save the day. What's going on around here? Oh, yes. A reminder that Matt lives aboard XL5. We had that last time we saw XL5 with drama at Space City. Her into space. Oh. Spread the disease from planet to planet until there isn't a lazoon left in the universe. So he's an interplanetary typhoid Mary at this point. I, I like the... Uh, the air of madness that John Bluthall puts into that voice there. Major, cut to automatic before it's too late. Major. Faster, faster into space. I must obey. And there's another early uh, integration of live action and uh, puppet shot coming up momentarily. Yes, here it is. Steve shoots through the door. We see puppet Jim and Robert. I'm okay, Major. I'm taking over. And a human hand comes up with the blaster to uh, point it at Jim. Fire retros, Robert. Fire retros. Oh. Jim's been taken away from the controls. Robert had a new friend there, someone who uh, also has no will of their own. I'm okay, Steve. But Zuni, poor Zuni. Well, you know. Yes, what goes on? Well, there's no time to explain now, Professor. It's a matter of life or death for Zuni. Fireball to Space City. Oh. Oh, well, if it's that important, I'll put some clothes on, Steve. Well done, Steve. Bring her back to base as soon as you can. It's an emergency, Commander. The Lazoon's real sick. We've got to find an antidote. It's myelomatosis. Oh, dear. So, Zuni is very ill. The antidote for myelomatosis. Where is it? Does anybody care? I mean, I, I, I would give this episode credit that it does make I'm you care. Slave. The price I had to pay. Although, I, I suppose strangely I care more about the guy who poisoned Zuni than Zuni himself. Business, Jim. Xanadu. The dome. The water of the frozen fountain of eternal life. Oh, it makes it sound so... You'll never get away with it. So scary. And you're going to help us. You hear that, Venus? Next stop, Xanadu. Do you think Zuni will make it? It's touch oh, Zuni looks dead already. Oh, no, he's still blinking. Hope. I'll make it as quick as I can. If only we can give him some of the frozen water from the fountain, we'll save him. And uh, giving Zuni water from the frozen fountain of eternal life. Is that a good move? Does that mean Zuni is going to live forever? Xanadu. So beautiful and so evil. I also like that this planet is... It, it's not a, a newly explored world. This is something that they already know about. And they are... They're doomed. Afraid of. As well they should be, even though the planet only has one resident. He's a very strange resident. Um, here we go, XL5 is landing on the planet near the Ice Palace. Uh, and this Ice Palace, I believe, later turned up again in Mystery of the TA2. As the... Oh, I can't remember the, the captain's name. Oh, Colonel Denton, yeah, who went and lived with the Ice Men. But we'll never get out. Well, we're going to try. Come on. So Jim's up for participating in the rescue, but he's very pessimistic about it. He, do, he doesn't really get a sort of clear resolution to his control. There's no moment where he's he suddenly goes, Oh, I'm free! Thank you for saving me. He just kind of sort of spends the rest of the story going, Oh, we're doomed. Hurry. But, oh, there we go. There's a mummy. I was just about to say that the music is creepily... It, it was effectively creepy. It's mummy. Frozen catacombs are full of them. But just this deeper exploration of the planet. Walking past these mummy cases with these chanting voices. This is very... No living creatures here? Uh, very unusually creepy for XL5. And uh, to be fair, the show did do creepiness quite well when it tried. I think also the fact that the show's in black and white. How horrible! There's a sort of noir horror air to it at times. You know, all these... Shadows, I think shadows look so much better in black and white than they do in colour, if that makes sense. But, yeah, it's just, maybe it's something about the black and whiteness of this lends another air of, uh, of spookiness. But it's pretty darn chilling all on its own. Just listen to that. I mean, those voices are of dead people. And we're seeing just row after row of mummies. <laughs> Yeah, 
there's some very effective um I guess this is Barry Gray uh, atmosphere stuff on the old uh, Ons Martino. Steve and his party are still making their way through the catacombs. I guess this is the way Jim came when he explored the planet. Oh, that's a pretty effect. A frozen fountain. A frozen fountain of life. Frozen with all the water in mid plume, which I don't think would quite work, but. The secret of Xanadu. Oh, here he is. Our favourite weirdo. Gun is aimed straight at your head. But before I kill you, who are you? Steve Zodiac, Space Patrol. <laughs> I love as well that Steve just introduces himself and then opens fire. It's like, that's all you're getting. Stand back. I've got to save Zuni. Nothing else matters. And there we go. He's broken off a piece of the fountain. Not a very big bit. But it seems to have done uh, enough damage to break the fountain. Let's hope we're in time. Hey, look, Steve. Now that you've smashed the fountain of life, Kudos has become an old man. Oh, and that's a very creepy shot. This puppet suddenly aged up, writhing on the floor. Yeah, Matt, but we may still be able to save the Lazoon. Come on. Although I'm, I'm, I, I, again, I'd have to question the uh, effectiveness of the Fountain of Eternal Life, considering Kudos is the only survivor of this entire race. What were the Lazoons doing to them to wipe them out? Oh, well, who cares? Because this Lazoon is feeling much better. He's going to be all right. Steve. Steve. He's coming round. He's going to leave. Forever, potentially. Yes, that is a chilling thought. And even more chilling is this. Hail you, my ancestors. Old man Kudus. Life has been destroyed. All his plans are in tatters. Kudus. His dreams of vengeance are totally thwarted. What can he do? Well, my mission. He could just retire quietly. Enjoy the last, you know, enjoy what little time he has left, or pull the lever for the self destruct mechanism and commit suicide. Because why not? And again, it, it's another part that adds to the, the creepiness of the character because he seems to drop dead at that point. And just the idea of a, a, a Super Mario Nation character committing suicide. Quite creepy, I've always found. The end of Maybe it's just the fact that I saw this as a kid and it is, you know, it affected me more then. But I think this is still a, a, a creepy and effective little story. But of course, we have to end with Zuni in the front seat of XL5, driving Robert insane. Again, this is it's this kind of behavior that probably drove the uh, the Kudus people extinct. It's mine. <laughs> Too late, Steve. Oh, dear. Well, as uh, Zuni does his best to thoroughly break Robert, and, yeah, he's really going into a meltdown here. Explosions in his head, chest, the smoke pouring out of his arms. But no one on the XFI crew is ever bothered about that because they've got Zuni back. And Zuni is now free to, uh, to wreak genocide upon more unsuspecting innocent races. Anywho, that was Last of the Xanadus and or as I say, the fact that I had this one on VHS as a kid and watched it a lot maybe colours my uh, my views on this one, but I've always found it a very, very creepy and effective little almost a horror story really. It's, it's just so so atmospheric and, and so just beautifully shot. But also, I think we have a really effective villain here in Kudus, and also the world that he lives in, that ice temple and those those catacombs with the mummies. It's just... Mummies! In Fireball XL5! We're really sort of acknowledging the concept of death with this episode in quite a heavy way. And there's just so many little bits that, to a young mind, really sort of went, whoa, this is quite weird. You know, the voices on the tape, that Kudus makes speeches to. He's just an all-round great weird villain, so all in all, one of my favourite spooky little episodes of Fireball XL5. Good stuff. Ooh, thank you, Chris. Yes. Another great. marvellous randomizer. They're always marvellous because it's always Chris doing them, so they're He's always very marvellous. consistent, isn't he? Yeah, he's yeah. annoyingly good and consistent. I know. He really How shows us up. do that. He really does, yeah. yeah. That's true. Oh, well. Uh, yeah. Moving swiftly on from being yeah, shown out by Chris Dale, mm -hmm. uh, he'll be back next week with another randomizer, and we'll be back next week with another yes. podcast, won't we? That's true. Yes, we will. Yeah. Yeah. 236, which 
Right. That's a nice mathematical thing, doesn't well, it? Well, because it's got the whole multiplication thing going exactly on. Exactly, two times three. You six, like that so sort of thing, don't you? I, it, just, it just appealed to me some, for okay. some reason. To, so, but, but Pod Strons, what's your favourite podcast number and why? Is it Pod 90 because you love Joe 90? Is it Pod 123 because it was the first of the three figure sequential oh. podcast? We'd love to know. But Do Jamie, we no one's gonna, we're not going to get com. any yes, emails someone about will. people's favourite pod numbers. Someone will, I bet uh. you. Ah. Please, please show him up, Podstrons. Please just send me an email, podcastdarianson.com. Thank you very much. Anyway. I mean, um, we've yet to get to Pod 2040, which, of course, would be my favourite. <laughs> oh, can't <laughs> wait for that It's going to be a while, one. isn't it? It's going to be a while. It's going to be several decades, but we'll get there eventually, yes. Oh, yeah, of course yeah, we will, yeah. 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 Richard uh, is sort of very elderly and, uh, yes. So, news, well, news, 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 news. <laughs> uh, I mean, I will yeah. be as well in several decades. Anyway, moving on to the end of this podcast. We'll be All back right. next week. Please do yep. rate, review, that's revate, subscribe, yep. email yep. us, tweet us, do all yeah. the usual stuff. We really all love that. hearing from you, Podstrons. Be nice to each other. Christmas is coming up. Do some nice things. And yeah, uh, yeah we'll be back in your clammy ears, your clammy festive ears next week for mm. Pod 236. Look forward to it. Me too. ta Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> One complete. Let's go. Spectrum is green. Well, yeah, I think they're going mm. to be emailing in their droves about what, their favorite, favorite pod, pod numbers. numbers. But you're yeah. not even talking about what was your favorite pod, as in what was your favorite episode. No, you're saying that, literally what's normal. your favorite that's number. That's boring. Everybody does that. Everyone's like, oh, no, what's your favorite podcast from the past? Your favorite interviewee? No, I don't want that. I want something a bit more esoteric, a bit more interesting and weird. <laughs> right. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I well, think they might surprise you. I know they might be might surprise hmm. you. I'm confident uh, yes. All right. yeah. in our Podstron's intellectual and engaged approach sure. to the Jerry well, Hansen podcast. Yeah, I'm quite right. Oh, I'm not arguing with that. So, Some of them are know. very engaged and quite intellectual. Exactly. There you go. Anyway, wasn't it nice to see them all at uh, London Comic Con a couple of weeks oh, ago? Oh, wonderful. Yes, of course it was. Absolutely yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. So thank you all of you for coming along there. That was really, really yes. lovely. And I've got some nice photos, which I, th- I think I posted on Twitter, but if I haven't, oh, I'm going to do it now. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, yeah. Great. Nice. Anyway, right. You go and decide on uh, your favourite podcast post number. No, what? That silly picture of me in the lights that you've wrapped all around my... Oh, I've definitely got... In fact, I'm oh. going to tweet that right this second. <sighs> Great. And while I do that, Thanks go and that. work out your favourite pod number that we've already had, not a future one, and email it to podcast.jerryanson.com, all right? Oh, look forward to it. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.